Always used to let you clean up the mess Just down on my knees Thought I couldn't stand up on my own Turns out sometimes you're stronger alone My name is Andrea. I'm 53 years old. I was one of Jehovah's Witnesses and I'm shunned. All right, Andrea. So how did you come to be one of Jehovah's Witnesses in the first place? My mom, they came knocking one day and she saw a way to provide what she thought would be a better life for my sister and I. So she completely did a 180, I guess it would be, and completely embraced this new religion. Um, we were former Catholics. I remember my sister's first communion in her little white wedding dress in the whole nine. She went to the local Catholic school, which was a private school in town. Um, my mom at one point worked three jobs just to keep that up and to support us because she was a single parent. Um, and that's how this whole thing started with my family. So you guys were leading this Catholic Catholic school life. Um, and then the witnesses come, they knock on your door. You said your mom did a 180. Was it a really quick 180 uh was she a person that you know immediately jumped in took to it six months later your life is different or did she you know take some time to do that no it happened pretty quickly from what i can recall um we were immediately thrust into this uh new life of meetings of, you know five meetings a week um we were in public school and we were dressing different, acting different, talking different. Um, we were taught to live a different way. Um, it took me a long time to get her to even be okay with me being friends with the neighborhood kids enough to play outside with the girl across the street. It was like one of my only friends. Um, we just, it happened almost immediately. She completely embraced everything that they said because she really did believe that this was the right path for her and her family. Um, and I, we immediately became the weird kids in school. <laughs> um, I remember going to the library every holiday, um, being the only kid in the library while all the holiday festivities were going on. I was the only weirdo not saluting the flag, standing up, putting your hand over your heart and all that. Um, I was the only kid in, in class who had to reject those little Valentines that the kids all used to give out. Oh, uh, yeah, that's rough. Um, it, was, it was a horrific way to be raised because um, you're, you're a little kid and you don't fully understand what's happening. All you know is that all of a sudden you don't have any friends and you're leading this weird life that you don't understand at all. And it was kind of um, coupled with the fact that my mother suffered from a lot of mental health issues okay. that I now recognize that that's what it was. Um, we'll get into on. that in a second um, when we, we'll, we'll talk about what things were like at home. Um, how old, before we get too far away from it, how old were you, I guess, and uh, you have one sister? One, yeah. Um, so how old were you and your sister when life changed? Five. I was five, and my sister's four years older than I am. Wow. So that's, um, so for you then... I guess you started out then more so your school life being the quote weird kid because it's not like because you were five. It's not like you had had some sort of school career previously, so to speak. But your sister, it sounds like really did. You know, she would have had to make some changes being four years older than you probably already had some little friends at school, maybe it already celebrated some holidays at school and things like that. So I can see that, I mean, I was eight, nine or so when my parents started um, becoming Jehovah's Witnesses. And I remember those changes. So it sounds like yeah, you all did have uh, some to, 
definitely make. And that's that's hard when you're that age. It was. It was extremely rough. I think it was more so rough for, for her, to be honest with you, um, because she never really had any friends to begin with. Um, not a lot of like worldly friends or she didn't even have that many friends in the Kingdom Hall. Um, because like we were always We were the family that were like still the outcast. My sister always had a weight issue that fluctuated her entire life, even as an adult. Um, She was picked on brutally in school. Um, It was bullying now is the term, you know. (laughs) Um, But she was, we both were actually. I was always the little runt and she was always the bigger girl. Um, so we never really had a lot of friends inside the Kingdom Hall or out in the world. And that had a huge impact um, of, in our relationship. We became each other's best friends um, because we had to be. Well, that makes sense. Um, so you, you see there, I guess, some evidence. I know there's... There's a class system in the Kingdom Hall, isn't there? I mean, it depends on the family that you come from. A lot of congregations have maybe one kind of dominant family uh, that's there. Or maybe there's that family that has the business that a lot of the brothers and sisters work for. And they're kind of the wealthy family. (laughs) Um, But if you're the struggling single mom. Yep. You would think that that would be the person they'd rally around, but it's not, is it? No, it's the one that you avoid like the plague. Mm -hmm. Um, And it it didn't, it did not help at all that we were um, extremely poor growing up. I remember that government cheese that came in the box that was that synthetic yellow. (laughs) Big box. Yeah, I remember the food stamps that came in a paper book. And I was always so embarrassed when we would go to the store and I would see like um, kids I went to school with. And here's my mom whipping out that booklet of paper coupons that were the food stamps back in the day. Um, But what sucked more than anything were the hand-me-downs because all of the kids in in the congregation, when they would, when the the females would grow out of their clothes, everybody would see me and my sister wearing them to the kingdom hall like a week later you know and everybody doesn't feel good does it no not at all not at all um sometimes we would be kind of stoked because it's like oh new clothes when my mom would bring home a bag of like you know clothes or whatever um but then other times it just felt so degrading you know, and as a little kid, you don't know these words like embarrassment and degrading. All you know is that you hear the whispers, you know, and you know you're poor. And we grew up in a filthy, poverty stricken, just things that didn't need to be were taking place in our home. And once my sister and I got a little bit older and we got a chance to take care of ourselves, we tried to change our surroundings because we truly were a product of our surroundings. Um, Like so much so that right now you could eat it out of my toilet bowl. I'm that clean. (laughs) I am a huge neat freak. (laughs) I I don't even go to bed with a spoon in the sink. You know, the first sign of ants, I'm calling Terminex. You know, it's like, and I grew up in a house full of roaches. So it's like, I can't even look at a bug and be okay. Like something inside of me switches on and it's like full blown paranoia slash unhealthy, (laughs) unhealthiness to a degree. It's one extreme or the other, you know, and it's, it's, and I know it, you know, but I I think there are worse things I could be (laughs) than a neat freak and a clean freak. So I'll take it. Understood. Um, you know, we feel out of control when we're kids in these situations. And then when we get older, we seek to grasp for that control. I uh, kill every bug around my house. I spray my house very regularly because I, too, grew up in a house full of roaches. Uh, and it is um, 
horrible to lay there at night watching the walls move at times and uh it's just a it's a bad bad place to be and it creates uh you know its own feelings internally that you want to never have again so i i totally understand um you know getting back to that piece about the clothing and such too you know when your clothing is a reflection of your identity and when all you get are hand-me-downs from the other people in the congregation you don't get to choose your style you don't get to choose your identity it is provided for you you don't really get to reflect that as much and it's it's not a, it's not a very good feeling to not be able to pick out your own clothes and what you want not at all and every year when this new school year rolled around um Thank God for my grandmother because she lived in Connecticut at the time and we lived in New Jersey and we would go and see her every year and she wasn't a witness. So um, she would buy us clothes and send us a huge box, like a care package every school year. And it would have new clothes, candy, coloring books, some toys. Um, during the holidays, she would sneak a couple of things in there. And my mother and her way of thinking is as long as we don't open it on Christmas, it's acceptable. <laughs> you know, I grew up in that household, too, where my um, some of my other family members were witnesses. And as long as we didn't eat the turkey on Thanksgiving, but we ate it the day before, the day after, it wasn't Thanksgiving. And, you know, growing up, you know, now as an adult, I can chuckle about that, but I'm like, such a way of thinking, you know, it's like, well, we got that free turkey and we have to cook it. But as long as we don't call it Thanksgiving, it's not Thanksgiving. Although it was the turkey God, and all right? the fixings. <laughs> yeah, all the fixings and everything. God's not very smart. The <laughs> God that they worship, apparently, because he can be tricked. He can't tell the difference between a Christmas oh. gift on the 25th or the 26th or... <laughs> You know, what day you eat the turkey on. He's, he's just oblivious to that. Paper. It, did, it wasn't wrapped in Christmas paper. So there technically it wasn't a Christmas present. Yes. <laughs> he's a god of technicalities. Exactly. So uh, stupid. <laughs> so you alluded to this already uh, somewhat. So um, what was your childhood like at home? So you say your mom was maybe suffering from um, some mental and emotional struggles. Um, what was life like in your house? What was the temperature of the room? How, how did you all interact with one another and with the witnesses? It was hell. <laughs> There's no other way. That was the temperature in my house. It was hell. And I grew up with a lot of animosity. Um, once I got to be a teenager, um, I had a lot of self-esteem issues that came with a lot of problems stemming from the way that we were raised. My mother was very physically, emotionally, and spiritually abusive towards my sister and I. I remember my sister got beat bad one time so bad that she bled. She actually had welts on her body. And the reason why I had so much animosity growing up is because you can't tell me that no one knew. Mm. Because the walls were paper thin. We lived in an apartment complex. And I know the lady next door to us, she had a son um, who was a little bit, maybe a couple years older than I was. And um, they were weird in their own way, I guess. But you can't tell me that she didn't hear what was happening to us pretty much on a daily basis. And DCS never came to the house. No one ever knew. We were threatened that if we ever told anyone that, you know, although this was an extremely dysfunctional house, the idea of being removed from that house was terrifying because this woman was the only thing that we knew. And we were so terrified. Every day it was just, Am I going to get hit? And she wasn't one of those people that kind of hit it. We would get popped in the kingdom hall if we fell asleep. If the meeting was almost over and we didn't comment, we would get pinched. Um, you would hear the smack of her hitting one of us 
echoing through the key to Paul, you know? So no one, I don't know. I doubt it because the elders never, no elders ever came for a shepherding call, you know, until she got sick. And that's later on down the line. But I held on to a lot of animosity because we literally sometimes used to go to the kingdom hall with bruises. And I couldn't wear a certain skirt this day because it would show scratches or, or cuts or something. And no one ever said a word. No one never stopped it. And back in the day, you know, it, it was, you know, not a big deal to you know nowadays they call it child abuse but <laughs> back when I was growing up even the neighbors could spank you you know oh uh, yeah that's what I was going to say at the <laughs> a certain time period uh I think some people weren't saying anything because everybody was beating the fire out of their kids it seems like there was just a lot of people that were doing that stuff um I hear the stories of Often, very often, whether it's in my coaching practice or here on the podcast, um, you know, I hear the stories. A lot of people had parents that were just extremely physically violent towards them. It's really, really sad. I grew up in a home where paper thin walls between two houses that were three feet apart. And I knew what was going on next door. And they heard my dad screaming at us all the time, you know, and just nobody said anything because I guess everybody was culpable. Yeah, exactly. You know, but it's not natural. It's not. To be it's it's super like, abusive and, and unhealthy. Is. And I'm not talking about a switch here or there. You know, yeah. we were lucky if it were a switch. I'm talking extension cords, you know, and I would do the whole, you know, if I knew it was coming, I would do the layering of the clothes. I would put on five underwear in three pants so I could try to soften the blow. <laughs> you know, it's like you try to prepare for it. And sometimes you just, you know, you took your licks. And because I was, I was always the scrawny little kid. I was a preemie at birth. And it just, it always took me a while to put on like weight. I wish that was a problem now. <laughs> <laughs> but I was always that scrawny little kid. And sometimes my sister, would take beatings for me because she literally thought my mother would kill me if she didn't take some of like she would take on the punishment for me and I had a horrible um I don't know an issue with stealing from the local store <laughs> I would steal bubble gum and candy and pass it out to the kids in school so they wouldn't beat me up that day because there was no relief. I was getting beat up at school. I was getting beat up at home. Um, and I'll never forget the, the time that I got caught stealing and I really did think she was gonna kill me because <laughs> that was her, she was, she was a yeller and a shouter and a screamer, but she was also, you know, her go-to was, I'm gonna put my hands on you and that way you'll learn. And we didn't learn. I didn't learn. At least my sister was the more obedient one. But me? No. That well, what are you me. learning? <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, you know, you're learning that it's okay to beat people. It's okay to um, hit them into submission. You know, that's not... Uh, what, what are the valuable lessons of this? Uh, and I'm not surprised you were bullied at school. Because you were bullied at home, and that's what often happens. A lot of times the kids at school can pick up on that because we were also the kids who got bullied at home by our own parents, speaking from my own experience. And so, you know, they can sniff that out, right? And and then it's just also really sad. I don't know if you, I mean, maybe because you were the one being taken out, maybe you didn't see this or know this, but maybe you have memory like i always just thought it was really horrible how you would you would hear a kid act up or maybe you were just hearing the parents suddenly rustling around snatching up a kid to take them out of the auditorium in the kingdom hall and everybody would just kind of snicker about it like it was funny like ha 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 or oh you know they're going to get it or whatever and it's like that's not funny 
it's no. not funny to to oh. watch some little kid get taken out of an adult situation that they should never be in to be taken in the back to get whipped so that they can come back and sit still for two hours. Well, see, she wasn't, I can count on one hand at the, how many times we actually like got to that degree because mm. we got the speech in the car before we even got out of <laughs> the car to go into the Keenum Hall. Now we've already did our watchtower. We've already studied for X, Y, and Z. You, I want you to comment at least once. And if we did not, <laughs> you know, hell to pay. You know, I don't care if you didn't get your nap in or whatever. You, I don't want to see you sleeping or whatever. And for a little kid who's already going to school, you know, you're already doing homework. And now you have to prepare for these meetings. And you have to, they're two hours, you know. And then we're, of course, I nodded off. And that was just, I knew right then and there, she, all she had to do was give me that look. And I already knew I was like a dead man walking when I got home <laughs> and I would hurry up and try to get out of the car and run in the house and pretend like I'm putting on my pajamas and going to sleep. And she would be like, get down here. You know, and I would, that would be, you know, fear. That's what I grew up with. I just grew up with this fear. And it's because, too, that she had this different persona once she got to the Kingdom Hall that was fooling no one. And after talking with so many other XJWs, I realized so many people grew up that way, that they had this parent who was one way at the Kingdom Hall. And then once she got home, she could take off that Christian hood and show the demon that she was. And so many people grew up like that. And I'm like, wow, really? So this is a thing. And it sucks that it was a thing, but that's how we grew up. Oh, absolutely. <clears throat> Being one of Jehovah's Witnesses is very much about appearances. It's about how you appear. So you try to appear one way at the Kingdom Hall, but then you show your real self when you leave. And a lot of people are doing that. Um so that was life there. You know, school, it sounds like, was kind of was very tough as well. You were getting bullied there. So there's no refuge there at school at all, is there? No, not at all. And it got even worse once she became a school helper <laughs> at my school. <laughs> yeah, it was like no reprieve at all whatsoever. She became an aide at my school. And it was just like, I, I can't I can't escape this at all you know and I tried my hardest to get good grades but I was one of those C's and D's and God helped me if I ever got an F you know and it was just it was hard to to be a kid and try to do kid stuff and try to get good grades and study and because I had all these underlying things going on at the same time you know and you can't really explain it to anyone because they don't you're the only Jehovah's Witness in your class so you know you don't no one's can relate to you not a single one and I'm a little kid they're not yeah, say, do you even know how abnormal at the time your life is it's because it's your life you don't know you're a kid you don't know how all the other kids live and so you might know that you're, quote, the weird kid a little bit, but at the same time, you don't know how weird, right? You don't know how deep the differences go and that it's cutting all the way from the religion to the way your mom behaves at home and the abuse and all of that. So it's, you know, even if you tried to explain it, you're a kid, you don't have the vocabulary or the, or anything to compare it to, really. You don't have a, a perception, a worldview. Allow me to break in here for a second. This channel is made possible by you, the listener. If you appreciate what we're doing here, please consider supporting at patreon.com slash shunned or leave a review on iTunes or other platforms, uh, like and subscribe. All those things help the channel. If you're looking for merch, you can go get some shun swag from the shunpodcast.com website or reach out there to be on the show. If you're looking for more ex Jehovah's Witness content, I'll recommend my first podcast called This JW Life. You can find that on podcast apps as well as YouTube. And if you're feeling stuck in life, struggling to find happiness and community, 
Maybe you're haunted by the past, beating yourself up, unsure of who you are or what you even want out of life now that you've lost this one identity that was given to you by a cult. Reach out through my other sites like xjwhelp.com, that's exjwhelp.com, or storyworkscoaching.com. And let's see about working together to help you find a life that fits you and who you are, maybe for the first time ever. And now, back to our guest. No, and once I did, I felt robbed. Once I got to be of age and saw the other kids and I would peek in their house or run in their house real quick because we weren't allowed in anybody's home and nobody ever came to our house. You know, my mother's biggest thing, her, her saying, anytime there was a knock at our door, the floors were always wet. <laughs> Every single time somebody came, the floors are wet. We can't let you in right now. The floors are wet. No, our house is filthy, dirty, and there's dishes piled up with mold on them in the kitchen. I remember our refrigerator went out, and it was out for years. We would go to the store and buy bags of ice and shove it in the freezer and then only buy a day's worth of food to keep it packed in there. I don't understand why, as a renter, she didn't know that she could contact the landlord and that they could fix the stove that was broken. My sister and I learned how to bake things on top of the stove because the oven went out and it was out for the duration that we lived there. The refrigerator was broke and then there were bugs in the fridge. There were bugs everywhere anyway. It was just a horrible way. And the, the few times that somebody did have to come inside, she would put paper all over the floor because the, the floors were just disgusting. And we had linoleum, mm -hmm. um, this flooring, and she we peeled it up and tried to clean the real floor. It was just horrible. And it's like, I think back to that and I'm thinking it was just pestilence, you know? And I don't know how we didn't contract anything. I was always sick. Um, my sister wasn't that sickly, but I was always sick. <laughs> and I'm trying to figure out why I wasn't sicker than I was living like that. Because it was just, I know when my sister finally moved out of there after my mother died, um, God only knows what they must have been thinking when they saw the place and the condition it was in. Because it should have probably been condemned. No one, I can only imagine how long it took. And my sister tried her hardest to clean you know but it, this is years of filth and dirt and grime and just disgust and I just she lives as I do the last time we interacted um she she has a very clean she had a clean place too but it's just hard looking back on that and and growing I could never imagine growing up in like like that Nowadays, I can't imagine. Understood. And I'm sure a lot of that was a reflection of <clears throat> whatever mental and emotional illnesses or suffering she had in, inside. Um, it doesn't excuse the behaviors, though. It doesn't, doesn't mean that they don't hurt or that they weren't scarring uh, physically, emotionally. It's really hard to grow up that way. And um, there are ramifications of that. So. Um, you were growing up that way at home and school obviously wasn't that refuge um at the hall it sounds like so was was there anything at the kingdom hall at all uh that you enjoy did you enjoy any field service did you make any doesn't sound like you really had any friends and it sounds like your mom probably loomed over everything but i don't want to put words in your mouth so oh, no. how was it yeah. Okay. It was exactly that. We were stifled and yeah. we didn't have that many friends. I can count on one hand using three fingers how many people were even friendly towards us growing up. Um, they had their own little cliques and they were all grouped off, almost like you said, by class. And who wants to be, you know, friends with the dirty girls? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and the girls who are poor and who have hand-me-downs and everybody else is wearing the latest fashions and we're wearing, you know, 
hand-me-down Wranglers and our shoes are beat up and run over. And, you know, the kids in the Keenum Hall who are supposed to be the compassionate ones, their fathers who are elders who are preaching from the podium are saying, yeah, treat, you know, treat, you know, act like Christ, you know. (laughs) Yeah, be brothers you know, and sisters, right? Yeah, Love each other. and nothing could have been farther from the truth. You know, one of my biggest bulliers was an elder's daughter, and she just made my life a hell. And I ended up in the B school, <laughs> getting counseled as a as a kid. You know, because of the lies that she would tell on me. You know, and then once I started growing into my own. And I started to not look as hideous as I was. <laughs> and I came into my, you know, you just, you grow up and you grow in and fill out. All of a sudden I was called boy crazy because some of the, you know, little boys in Keenum Hall started to notice, you know, hey, she's not that bad, <laughs> you know? And automatically I got this stigma put on me. And None of the witness mothers who had sons wanted their sons to have anything to do with me because all of a sudden, all these rumors came out of nowhere once I started growing up, you know, and then after a while, you start leading that double life. Hey, I don't have to be friends with you, but I can start being friendly with some of these kids at school who were, you know, I did have a couple of worldly friends. Because I was trying to be like them, you know. I hated all of the kids just about in the kingdom hall. I hated all of them, you know. But in the world, certain worldly people started to accept me. And I'm like, okay, now I have a friend, you know, or two or three. So I was one of the ones who would go to school, put on a face of makeup and be one of them. And then on the way home, I'm scrubbing my face, trying to, you know, (laughs) make sure I have everything off and I'm pulling up my shirt, you know, you know, I'm not showing cleavage. And I I was even borrowing clothes from some of these worldly kids. So I would look like them. I would change in the bathroom and then all of the whispers would start. And my mom would ask me, are you doing X, Y, and Z when you get to school? No, (laughs) of course not. Until I got found out, you know. But she came to the school one day because I had forgotten something and she saw me. And that's when my life became a whole different other hell because <laughs> she discovered that I was, you know, it was true. I was leading a double life and I never tried to hide it. You know, I after a while, I was just like, I want to be like them, you know, and I got the speech. Well, as long as you live in our house, you're going to serve Jehovah. <laughs> And if you don't, you're going to go to that school for those wayward girls down the street. We got that speech all the time. If you get pregnant out of wedlock, you're going to that girl's school. If you do this, you're going to that girl's school. If you do, and I'm like, and it was this girl's school in my town for like these wayward kids. (laughs) And that was our threat, you know, or you won't get into the kingdom. You know, that was her other big thing. Mm -hmm. And at one point I'm like, screw it. I don't want to get into the kingdom if it's going to be like this. You You don't want to be with them anyway, right? No, I'm trying to get away from them. (laughs) (laughs) I don't want to be in a whole world full of you guys. No. You know, I think you brought up something a a second ago about um, people starting and spreading rumors. Um, And... Uh, I'm sure it happened among young brothers as well. Um, I wasn't around it growing up, but I knew, and especially once I got to be a young ministerial servant, the sisters, the young sisters at my congregation at least, were brutal to one another in these stories that they would fabricate um, and throwing each other under the bus. You know, this you talk about being boy crazy, right? Like they'd be making up stories about each other, being interested in this person or being with this person or whatever. They just it just went it went wild, and it was really sad just to watch them consume each other in a way that I mean, it was just it was brutal, and um, it was really sad. You know, here you are, and of course because. 
you're the female, you're the girl in 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 those times, you know, um, you're boy crazy, right? It's not the boys' problems for being girl crazy. I don't know if there's ever been a young man who's been counseled in the congregation for being girl crazy, but I'm sure there was a lot of girls that were counseled for being boy crazy. And just like you said, by the nature of the body you were growing into, these adults were putting their thoughts and such onto you and projecting in ways that are really kind of gross to think about. And it's really like, you're just, what are you supposed to do? You're just a young girl who's developing. That happens. You can't not do that. What are you supposed to do? And then you get labeled the, the shame is cast upon you, which is really sad. Oh, yeah. yeah. And Whether you do as, anything or not. Oh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Because you're yeah. doing it, even if you're not doing it. You're doing yes. it. You know? Yes. <laughs> you're guilty. Yes. You're, guilty. you're that temptation you for the young men. <laughs> and it's not like growing up, you know, there were a bunch of cleavage and short skirts. You know the dress code. Of course. We were covered up from head to toe. Nothing above the knee, pantyhose, tights. I, I haven't worn pantyhose in 40 years. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, you know, you just covered up completely. There's no temptation there. It's all in your, you know, it's the mind. It's the control aspect of it. <laughs> and once I got to school, it wasn't my fault that you can't keep your eyes in your head. <laughs> you know, and like you said, you hit the nail on the head. As soon as you develop a crush on, of course, it's going to happen as you grow up. You're going to develop a crush on certain boys in the kingdom hall. You just are. And don't let the other girls find out that you like so-and-so because it becomes this thing, you know. And I can't tell you how many parents came to my mom expressing an extreme disinterest in their son having anything to do with me, you know. It, yeah, I did the same thing. How mature. I mean, yeah, how can you not roll your eyes? How mature that these adult men and women, or maybe it was just the moms who came to your mom, I don't know, but would say, hey, keep your daughter away from my son or whatever. Yeah. Like, that's that's horrifying. How old? That's, you know, talk about bullying. Yeah, it, it came from everywhere. I have had haters. Since I was a child, <laughs> I can laugh about it now, but it just, it's from childhood, just the pure, and which the kicker, the ultimate kicker is when social media first started to come around and Facebook and MySpace and all that stuff started happening. I was flabbergasted when these freaking people had the balls to try to add me as their friend on Facebook. Facebook was the, the biggest one. Every bully that I, I was attacked in school by two boys in the bathroom. Damn it if one of those boys did not try to add me on Facebook. <laughs> I was like, are you kidding? Why would you want to know any aspect of my life when you made my life a living hell growing up? And, well, all and why of, would you, why, why would, yeah, why would you assume that I would want anything to do with you, the bully, the person who was bullying me? Yeah, I don't want anything to do with any of you. What, all of a sudden, I'm, now I'm going to be fake? And no, especially as an adult, I could not deny the requests quick enough that were coming in. I don't want to have anything to do with you. I don't care if we're older now, and maybe you should be over it. You know what, I am over it, and I've moved on. But see, your face on my feed at any point in my life is something that I don't need to see. And I have absolutely no desire to see you at all whatsoever. I don't care what's going on in your life. I don't care about your kids, your grandkids or anything. I don't care, you know, and it's not that I am still, you know, holding a grudge or anything. I'm not. I came to terms with you being the bitch that you were or the, you know, the prick that you were, <laughs> you know, I came to terms with all of that already. And it, kids are kids, whatever. 
But that doesn't mean that as an adult, I want you any part of my life because I don't. No. <laughs> I've been doing fine without you for all this time. I don't need, I, I, I'm not starved for friendship that bad that I need you in my life at all whatsoever in any capacity. That's <laughs> true. Um, boundaries are healthy things. They uh, really are. Even on social media. So, so as you are going, so I guess I'll ask, are there any seminal moments in your adolescence or maybe leading up? I don't know when you, when did you get baptized? I got baptized in 47, 40, in my 40s. <laughs> you got baptized in your 40s. Okay. Yeah. So then, I was in and out. In okay. and out. So then as a young, uh, were there any seminal moments growing up that we overlooked that you wanted to make sure that we talked about or anything that was going on as you were going into your teenage years? Yeah, my uh, huge pivotal moment came when I was 15. My mother got sick. She never took care of herself the way that women are supposed to with your exams and whatever, never took care of herself. And this is a woman that bled every day since I knew her. And I knew that that wasn't right. And she also had this horrible smell to her, like she was literally decaying right in front of us. And she got really, really, really sick when I was 15. And she was diagnosed with cancer of the uterus. And she went in to the hospital to have surgery. And my sister quit high school her senior year to take care of me and get a job. She got a job at the same place my mother had worked at the time. And my mother was maybe extremely sick for about six months. And when I was 16, she died. The very next day, I stopped going to the Kingdom Hall. And that was a huge source of contention in my house with my sister and I. And um, my worldly best friend ended up becoming my legal guardian and I lived with them. And my father finally started to pay child support because I was still a minor. And then I started to get into a lot of trouble and all the witness kids treated me like I was had leprosy because I was completely out in the world then. Um, so my sister suggested that I move to Connecticut where my mother's family was from. And I ended up moving my senior year of high school to a new state, a new school. My graduating class in my New Jersey school would have been about a hundred kids, maybe if that. And I went to a new school where my graduating class was about 600 kids. I went to this, I went home the first day of school crying because I just did, I could, it was too much. It was like Metropolis. I came from this little town in New Jersey and I went to Metropolis in Connecticut. And uh, there was just so many new changes going on. Um, I had already started dabbling with drugs and alcohol, living with the worldly girl and her family. But once I got to Connecticut, I was, my sister told me when I was in New Jersey that I had to write a letter stating that I didn't want to be a Jehovah's Witness anymore. She told me that's what the elders said that they needed. Um, and I believed her and I wrote this letter and it was disassociating myself. So when I moved, I was in a disfellowship state when I was 16 and everybody treated me like I was disfellowship when I got there. You can't disassociate when you're not baptized, right? I mean, I guess, I guess. I know there was a time, I'm pretty sure that there was a time where there was, that did exist as a thing. And I guess they were really just getting you to, in writing, own up to the fact that you weren't living that life. So they could mark you, basically, because they can't just fellowship you officially. You're not uh, a baptized witness. But, wow, that's... So... <laughs> They have nothing to say to you that's helpful, but hey, we're here when you need us to uh, reprimand you in some way or discipline us. Now we care, and now we're going to reach out. So uh, actually, let me back up. Your mom gets sick and dies. 
do the brothers and the sisters in the congregation rally around you kids? They only came over once I started acting out. So nobody from the Kingdom Hall is like, hey, there's two kids alone in an apartment, I guess, um, that just lost their mom. Let's take them in. Uh, instead, it's your, I guess, maybe 17 to 18-year-old sister who is now acting as the head of the house, leaving yeah. school, getting a job, and I guess being even like the spiritual head of the house, it sounds like, to some degree. I wanted nothing to do with it. We yeah. actually got into a physical altercation. Hands. We fought each well, other. That's yeah, that's how things were settled. Yeah, and I, I wanted nothing. And the only time that the brothers came to the house was when they heard I was dating a worldly guy. When I started acting out. When I said I was leaving home, you know, after my mother died, yeah, we got the Tupperware dishes of food. And, you know, we got, I think, one or two shepherding calls. And after that, everybody went on with their lives. And my sister did the best that she could. But I was so mentally so far gone and pissed off and mm -hmm. angry and scared and hurt and just completely, I had no direction anymore. I didn't know who I was. I didn't know who I was supposed to be. I didn't, I knew I didn't want to be a witness. And as soon as she died, I immediately turned that whole thing off. And my sister was not having it at all. So I said, I'll go. And the elders were like, you can't leave. I said, well, watch me. <laughs> you can't leave. I'm leaving. I don't I want to stay here. Who are you to dictate that? You're not, yeah, you're not taking any involved. responsibility for me, are you? I mean, yeah. Now you care? Now you no. care, yeah. Did they do anything for your mom? Did did they have like a witness memorial service for her or something? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That was the one good thing. And my father crawled out of, you know, the ether. Because he was nowhere. This man literally lived four blocks away. I can count on one hand how many times I saw him. He's just never around. Just, And I don't understand how you can actually have kids that you know where they are and you just know. But he came to her memorial talk and the place was packed. It was packed. She was very well liked and loved in, within the congregation. She died faithful. She did. She died faithful. And, you know, the kicker is that she lost a lot of blood. And if she had gotten a couple of blood transfusions, it could have extended her life. But the blood issue, <laughs> you know, so and I couldn't when I I remember when I, I got the same exact cancer that she got. My mother died when she was 52. And I. Got, I had my surgery in 2011, I think it was, 2011. Yeah. And I got the same exact, only I take care of myself. You know, first sign of a cough, I'm at the doctor. <laughs> and um, they caught mine early. They caught mine early. Hers was stage four already. But they, I got the same exact cancer that she got. And I had a complete hysterectomy. And the brothers came with their little committee that they come to the hospital with and the blood issue was you know and I was just like and I, I I don't know if I was baptized at the time but I know I was studying and once I was baptized I had the blood card and all of that stuff and I could, I think that was one of the first things I burned along with all of the my books and all of that um it's just their way of thinking it not only destroys lives, but it takes lives. Yeah, it you know? kills people. It really does. But she died faithful. So <laughs> that's all that matters. She died a faithful, baptized Christian witness. So um, more power to her.
That must have. I mean, what a tough. Uh, I mean, as if the teenage years uh, are not tough enough. Um, with everything else that you're going through, and now this happens, so you end up with moving in with the worldly family, or non Jehovah's Witnesses. You end up dabbling in some things there. You now have moved to Connecticut with more family, yeah. and um so and you're going to school there so what do you do where do you go from there i, I guess you graduate and what do you yeah. do i got into a bunch of trouble of course <laughs> i stayed consistent and i immediately found my tribe within the congregation i found all of the kids leading a double life and we became fast friends because I literally moved in with an 80-year-old, my 80-year-old aunt, <laughs> and anything went pretty much, you know. I knew I could get over on her. She, I was the apple of her eye. If I could change a few things there, she's passed now, but I would have treated her better. But, you know, I can't have regret about that. She literally did everything she could for me above and beyond. Um, I went to prom. My prom dress cost more than my wedding dress. <laughs> I had this, I had the life that I had always wanted because I knew if I stayed in New Jersey, I would either end up a statistic, pregnant teenage girl or dead, overdose or something, excuse me. And I went to Connecticut and I just, I fell in with the wrong crowd. I had a blast. I graduated from high school, barely. <laughs> I was cutting class. I was, my grades sucked. I had to take welding my senior year of high school because I needed credits because I failed all four marking periods of math because I never went. I was just a horrible, I was a horrible kid. I just, I was. I acted out so much that I literally got into so much trouble and was arrested so many times. And I put my poor aunt through hell that I finally got court ordered rehab or jail. And that's where I met my ex-husband. <laughs> okay. Well, um, I know that behavior wise, some might look and say you're a horrible kid, but I'm sure you were just a very, very hurt kid. Uh, who had experienced things your whole life that were way bigger than you, and you had no, you were like you said, acting out because you had no idea how to handle any of that. And um, it's a shame. It's it's you were put on the wrong path from the beginning, you and understand? it did not get better until way later. <laughs> I got That's married. And I was, how it works. And it, you know, like, looking back now, you know, it's like, like I said, if I could change a couple of things, I would. But these were all really learning experiences that molded me into who I am today. Well, so yeah, Most I'll, kids are kind of given a role to play when they're young, right? And yeah. then and if that role is a really unhealthy one because they're around really unhealthy people that hurt them, then sometimes they'll go a certain way and... It's going to take uh, years and lessons to reprise that role or to change that role really into something else that is healthier. And it sounds like it has that has been your path. Um, just sad that you had to start off on the wrong foot to begin with. Didn't deserve that. Yeah. You're just a little kid, right? Like no little kid deserves that. No. And I often think about if she never became a witness, what my life would be like now. I, I think about that, not a lot, but it does cross my mind, you know. Yeah, it's hard adult. to know, you know, we always kind of tend to think of best case scenarios. It also could have got run off the rails in other ways. But I will say that Jehovah's Witnesses, while they are not responsible for everything that people do, for sure, there's not much they can't make worse. They feed in because the it's also dysfunctional. Yeah. And it's all so toxic. It encourages a lot of toxic and abusive behavior. It in, it makes people who are already prone to that worse in a lot it of does. ways. 
And it doesn't it's help a reason and an excuse. No, and it doesn't help when you discover certain things that will numb that feeling. Oh, yeah. You know, it, that, that did not help at all. And I quickly discovered numbing agents. <laughs> well, of course you did, because your mom had two. What is becoming one of Jehovah's Witnesses, but numbing out and escaping into a doctrine where you no longer have to think about anything, you're told who to be, you're told what to do, and you just kind of hand your mind and heart over to other people and say, hey, you all handle it. I'm going to get involved in this thing. Whatever has hurt me in my life or whatever mental and emotional struggles I have will be fixed by a God at Armageddon. I don't have to be an active participant in my recovery. I'll just let it go. So we were always around addiction. That's what being one of Jehovah's Witnesses is. It's compulsive for a lot of these people, and they can't stop doing it. It dominates their entire life and controls how they react to in every scenario in their life. So yeah, I'm not, I would not be surprised. And often it is the case that people from that environment without any healthy mental and emotional tools are going to find another escape to go into because no one, they don't have anything else to work with. No, and it took me a very long time to be okay without them. You know, sure. it, it took me a very long time. You know, I only went to rehab because I was afraid of jail. As soon as rehab was done, I married someone who was a substance abuse counselor. So our entire five-year marriage, I was substance free. They didn't even have a glass of wine because he was sober and there was, you know, we were a package deal. And I was 21 and he was 35. And I got married <laughs> because I, I knew that would tame me and that I desperately needed structure. And I saw where my life was headed and I didn't want that. So I said, okay, I'm going to get married. We got married a year from the day we met. <laughs> and we were married and we, he started studying. I started studying. Um, that was one of the biggest reasons why we got married is because he started to have some thoughts about us just living together. I started having some thoughts about us just living together, um, being sexually active and we're not married. So I, I think more or less we kind of pushed marriage onto each other um, because of the brother he was studying with, I know was in his ear. And the woman who was studying with me at the time, she was in my ear constantly. Um, so we got married and we had a lot of problems. Um, age difference was definitely starting to show some, you know, stress in our marriage. We were just two completely different people. And we finally just, we grew apart after I, you know, I really wanted to start a family. And he didn't grow up as a witness, but he grew up in an extremely dysfunctional home that didn't have Jehovah in it, but it was just as bad. And he didn't want to be a he didn't want to be a spitting image of his father, so he didn't want to have any kids, and he was only going to have a kid to make me happy until he even didn't even want to do that. So I thought it would be best while I'm still young for us to just go our separate ways, and you know, all this time later, neither one of us have any kids. He's my friend on Facebook. He's a great guy. He really is. We just grew apart, but. Um, you know, it, it happens, but it doesn't mean that he was just this vile person or whatever. Um, he could have been more attentive, but, you know, that's water under the bridge now, you know. So. Yeah, I mean, any relationship is of two people who are bringing their own brand of dysfunction to some degree uh, because nobody is walking around, you know, fully healthy and always. And, uh, you know, how could, you know, how could you have brought, you know, a totally healthy view to the table either? Because you're, look what, you know, where you're coming from, right? And what mental and emotional 
tools have you been given? And it's just really, it sets us up. It's a recipe for failed relationships coming from the witnesses. It's a recipe for um, strife. It is. It really is, you know. And after we split, he stopped studying. So, you know, and went on to have a very productive and happy life. You know, it's funny once you remove that equation. I noticed this with like a lot of XJWs that I talk to. As soon as you remove a certain equation from your life, your life improves, you know. Mm -hmm. I wonder why that is. <laughs> it's not a fluke, you know. All these years, I had been struggling in and out, in and out, in and out. And when I got this fellowship, I was devastated because I knew my relationship that I had been trying to save with my sister was completely going to be severed, you know. Um, and that was hard as she's my last living relative. <laughs> Um, that's She's hard. also the person that you kind of trauma bonded with to some degree throughout your childhood, right? I mean, yeah. you all and you all were all you had. I mean, legitimately yeah. all you had uh, going through all of this. So yeah, it makes sense. It's it's going to be difficult to. I know just a little bit when we were talk, talking before the interview. You know, I had mentioned something about people pleasing and how Jehovah's Witnesses create people pleasers. Um, sometimes that could also just be referred to as codependency. And sometimes co codependency is referred to as love addiction. And, you know, just yet another addiction, uh, you know, of sorts that comes into play through the dysfunction that we all came from. Um, what even, even though we may all have different circumstances, your mom obviously had some of her own individual particular challenges that played out in your household in the form of certain abuses. It's just, at the end of the day, none of us really grew up in a healthy environment. It was all, it, it was all abusive in its own way. And, so, and I've been searching for that healthy environment my entire grown-up life. Yep. And that's why I am so, I'm such a private person now. And I have my own home that is my safe haven, and it is so fiercely guarded. I am very cautious who I let into my little bubble world now, because I used to roll deep with a lot of world, you know, people in general. I used to have a crowd of friends, you know, and then I realized that I really had a lot of acquaintances. I didn't really have a lot of friends, you know, and I had to kind of put that in perspective to who I call friend now, um, because even as a grown up, you know, who's lived half her life, I still can count on one hand how many friends I have right now. You know, I am very guarded. I'm very cautious. I don't trust hardly anyone. <laughs> oh, I mean, <laughs> well, uh, I. Yeah, so we grow up in an environment where there is no healthy vulnerability. All vulnerability is seen as uh, is exploited, and so and used against us. Um, it is a beautiful thing when we can find people around us where we can be vulnerable in a healthy way, and they are healthy people too, and we can have really great relationships. Uh, it does exist, but I, you know, it, it is difficult to trust again when your trust has been abused over and over and over again. I, you know, I don't need, I don't, I'm at a place in a point in my life where I have so many other good things going on. Mm -hmm. And I'm, it took me years, years to finally say that I'm happy within. And I'm still in therapy. <laughs> I've been in therapy for years, um, and it has helped me. No, I am such a huge mental health advocate, and I'm also a child abuse advocate and awareness. I I volunteer, you know, to bring awareness so that people can. This is still happening every day. Kids are dying at the hands of people who say "I love you" to them, and as a child abuse survivor, 
I feel almost compelled to contribute in some way that I can, you know, and a lot of people, uh, 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 maybe 99.9% of the people who know me, they don't know this aspect of my life. Mm. I have always been ashamed, always been ashamed of this. Mm. I was ashamed of how I was raised. I was ashamed. And the kicker is that even in my adult years as a raging alcoholic and just an abuser of, you know, pick a drug. Nobody ever asked me what was going on. No one ever said, do you need help? I was just always the party girl, you know, the life of the party, who was always drunk, you know, who picked up the tab and who was, you know, the, the crazy one, you know. And no one ever, none of my friends ever pulled me aside and said, what's going on with you? It was easier for them to abandon than to help. It was easier for them to talk shit about me behind my back for me to later find out, or sometimes right to my face, you know, than to offer suggestions that could help me. Well, that's you know? And that's nobody's. It's you not his job. <laughs> yeah, but that's why you couldn't be vulnerable with those people because they're unhealthy. When you're vulnerable with healthy people, then you can find depth of relationships and share these kinds of stories with people who are healed enough themselves to be able to have these kinds of conversations at a deep level and to you know just connect over them and to respect each other and such. But when you're with other people who maybe are even hurt the same and are also unhealed themselves and are also escaping, it's unfortunate because it just becomes a feeding frenzy at times. And again, once again, that vulnerability, even if it was, if if you were able to articulate it all, is exploited yet again. And um, I don't know if you've ever seen, the, there's a YouTube channel called Soft White Underbelly. Um, but um, can't remember the guy's name, but basically he goes on Skid Row and then he goes to other areas too uh, of the country, and he's talking to people who, you know, are severely addicted to drugs, who are homeless, who whatever the case may be, and the common denominator is they were all abused as kids at home. I mean, it's just these these aren't you know when you see homeless people. We define them by what they lack, a home, uh, in their title, but really they're just trauma survivors. Most of them are people who have dealt with severe trauma in their life, and then at some point, because they didn't have tools or resources, or they were just hurt that badly, they escaped into some things, and then that ended up destroying their life. And and it's just really, really sad. There's just so many people walking around this earth today that are just really struggling. And a lot of it comes from, they're just little kids in big bodies walking around still hurt. And um, we just don't do a good job as a, as a society of uh, helping and of, you know, and of course they have to want the help too they have to be ready for the help you can't help somebody who doesn't want it they have to ask for it so that's the key. it's it, it's tough i mean it is it's very hard and as an adult i've discovered that it's really hard to find and maintain healthy relationships because of all of those reasons you know i've gone through the homelessness i've gone through the drug addiction i've gone through the alcoholism i've gone through having a complete mental breakdown and hospitalized for it. You know, all of these vulnerable things, you know, you go through and it molds you into who you can become and who you are becoming. I'm still developing and I'm 53 and I'm still developing people skills and learning how to live a, a healthy life and learning how to be completely happy. You know, not many people can say that they are truly, genuinely happy. 
Mm-hmm. I am finally at that point in my life where I am genuinely happy with who I look at in the mirror. And it took years for that to happen. Years. Well, that's really where it all starts, right? You have to be happy with yourself. But as Jehovah's Witnesses, when you're raised in that environment, you're never good enough. So you're literally taught to be miserable with yourself at all times, to gaslight yourself just like they're gaslighting you, to doubt your own thoughts and feelings, to make yourself feel bad all the time. And then when you do the work, um, and, you know, because again, it's not time heals all wounds, it's time and work in the right direction. Time alone doesn't do it without the work. Then, yes, you can heal and you can start to. Once you have that foundation within, you know, and I and I hope someday for you, if if it's something that you like, I I I hope that you do find some people in your life who can truly who can listen to this story and truly appreciate you for you and and see you see all of this as look look how strong she is that she's been able to go through all of this and get to a point where she's found a happy place. That's something to be respected. That's not something to shame. Anyone who would shame you over where you came from and the difficulties that you've had, um, they're not your, they're not going to be in your friend group. That's not, that's not who you want in your life. Um, If that's who they are, well, they have some healing to do and they're probably projecting their own issues onto you instead of just respecting you and your growth process. It's true. It's true. And I had to learn that the hard way. It wasn't until after I got divorced, packed up everything and moved to California, which what I thought was going to be just to regroup. (laughs) I thought I was going to come here for a couple of months, heal from my divorce and go back home and start life over again. Now I put everything in storage. I packed up a car, went with my friend and my cat, and we drove out here to California. She left like a month or so later. And I've been here ever since. And I've been here, I've lived in California longer than I've lived anywhere else, you know? And it has been an up and down, up and down. Here's where I, a lot of things happened that were good. Here's where a lot of things happened that weren't so good, but I'm finally at that place now, you know, um, where I'm, I'm, I'm okay with just being, Mm -hmm. I'm okay with just, I'm no longer just existing. I'm actually thriving now. And I don't see that as, that would have never have happened if I didn't get this fellowship. I would still be one in, one out. Now I'm out. I'm out, out. And I know, I always joke around with other XJWs. I'm like, if anybody in this day and age is still an active Jehovah's Witness with all of the information that they are privy to within JW.org and elsewhere, then Something is wrong mentally. I say that being a Jehovah's Witness is a mental illness. <laughs> yeah, I say that on here all the time. <laughs> you know, it, I really do. Because I, I I understand how indoctrination works and I know how strong it is to deprogram one's brain mm-hmm. to go along with their actions. I know all about it firsthand. I'm still in therapy because of it. Sometimes I slip into that Jehovah's Witness way of thinking, even after all of this time. And I'm like, wait a minute, you don't have to be fearful of X, Y, and Z because it's BS, <laughs> number one, <laughs> you know. But there's too much information out there. And if you have eyeballs and you read the news globally, if that's not enough of a turn off, and I already know what they'll say, you know, sinful man, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> you know, they're brainwashed, not- right? They're, they're, they've been yeah. coerced into this thing. And now they're they, blind. They, they are. And Unfortunately, people like my sister, this is all she knows. You yeah. know, this is it. This is all she has ever known. My sister, I'm 53, 4, 5, 6. My, my sister is 57. She's never been married. She's never had children. She's never had a relationship. She's never even been kissed by a man. She's, she, there's something that developed mentally speaking. Something is wrong there. 
because you never have had that human contact because you're told she has devoted her entire life to a falsehood. And yeah. the witnesses, the society, the brothers, it, Bethel, all they can tell her today, this whole thing has been a lie. It's all bullshit. It's all lies. We've been taking your money and feeding you a bunch of junk. You can, you're free now. She would still stay. Of course. Because this is all she knows. And that is heartbreaking for me. Yeah, all she ever wanted growing up was to have a, a husband and kids. This is a girl who bought brides magazines as a child. Stacks and stacks from her allowance. And had a hope chest since she was like 10. With all the stuff she wanted in her life. And all of that has never happened. Yet they still proclaim that they're happy. But their eyes show the sadness, you know. You can lie out of your mouth, but I know you know you. And I know that you're unhappy. But that fear grips you, the indoctrination, the brainwashing. You don't know any other way of life. And I'm almost, I, I would almost be fearful if she was in the world. Because this world would eat her alive. Because they almost live in their own little Amish bubble world, you know. Figure it out. Every, people do every day, but it is it is sad that so many are lost and have lost so many years to this. Um, it's actually I haven't watched it. It's been a long time since I watched it. But there was something called Kumare. I think it's called K. I think it's K U M A R E. It was um, a little documentary that a guy did where he pretended to be a guru, a spiritual guru, and he wanted to see how this thing went. And he put himself out there as this, you know, the great Kumare, and he had all this wisdom and all, he built this huge following. And then at the end, you know, he, well, spoiler alert <laughs> uh, for anybody who hasn't seen it, I'll recommend that you do, but, because uh, it is interesting, but I mean, basically, he comes clean at the end, and what he's trying to show people is like, you never needed me. It's all within you. You have the ability to go do things. You just needed permission. And uh, they're super upset, and some of them still believe in him. And, you know, it's this is it's the nature of belief, right? And it's the nature of the ego and what we get attached to, the labels we attach to. Uh, just like if you were to try to get a Democrat to admit that Obama did some messed up things, or you're trying to get a Republican to admit that Trump did some messed up things. We identify with these labels at times to a point where we lose our objectivity at times. And because we're over identified with it, it's the same reason you can't wake up Jehovah's Witnesses. There's nothing between, there's no separation between their ego and themselves and this label of Jehovah's Witness. So if you try to talk about Jehovah's Witnesses and some horrible thing they've done, they feel like it's a personal attack because they're overly attached. There's They're overly identified with that label. And, you know, at the end, this is a, just a human thing and it happens everywhere. It's not just Jehovah's Witnesses. It's not. And it's unfortunate. It's a wasted life. And... I could continue to kick my own butt about all the years that I've wasted, but it's just forward motion, you know? All I can do from this point onward is keep doing what I'm doing that makes me happy, you know? I know who I am. I know what I bring to the table, and I'm happy with every part of that. Well, that's, that's a beautiful thing. That's good. It is. It's a great thing. And you said that part of it, so... Things really changed after you got this fellowship because you talked about having one foot in, one foot out. So how did we get to a point, you said that you were in and out a lot. I guess I would ask, why did you, why, why do you feel you were continually attracted to that? What was it that made you, I guess, what was it that made you keep going back to the witnesses? Yeah. Um, to the point, what was the draw of it? Yeah. Um, Fear? Okay. Fear. Fear of? Armageddon. Armageddon. There you go. Fear of God. Yeah. Fear of their God. Yes. The, yes. Fear of Jehovah. Fear of that the God. angry God yeah. that is going to murder you if you don't do what he says. 
Yes. The loving God that he is. Yeah, do as I say or I'm going to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> well, honestly, wow. Honestly, that's kind of a reflection of even where you grew up, right? Do as yeah. I say or there are going to be very harsh repercussions. You know, these yeah. types of the Jehovah's Witnesses are often a reflection of the God they serve, their brand of God. Um, yeah. Very controlling, authoritarian, and punishing. And I so had to get over that fear. Okay. And, and that's what I did. And what was it that got you to a point, you know, I don't know what you want to tell about those years in between, but what what was it that got you to the point where you got baptized? Fear of my sister not being a part of my life. Because mm. she had told me all, like, even when she was a little kid, like I told you about the bride's books, I'll never forget when she told me this. She said, if you're not serving Jehovah and if you're not a baptized Christian, you're not going to be in my wedding. <laughs> and I, she told me that when we were little kids. And I, I had always thought about that. When she, when she, like, and I, not that I laugh about it now, but I just look back and I'm like, it started so early, you know? and just as we grew up as adults together, it was so important for her to be proud of me. That was always, even now, you know, it's, I just always wanted her to be proud of me, you know? Wow. And I knew that if I got baptized, that's what she had always wanted for me. She always she always wanted us to stir Jehovah together. You know, even though she lived in one state and I lived in a different state, as long as we had Jehovah, there's nothing that we couldn't do. You know, and I just, I finally said, you know, this is the piece of the puzzle that will finally meld us for life. And... That's why getting disfellowshipped was so hard because um, I knew our relationship would never be the same. And I knew once I got disfellowshipped, I wasn't coming back. And let's get to that. Let's get to the disfellowshipping in a second. But the baptism part, the wanting to make your sister proud. What is really sad about this, it's not, it's not just you and your sister. I mean, this is... I hear it all the time on the, you know, in these interviews, I work with a lot of people in my cult recovery coaching practice who are struggling with this too. You know, we're wanting, it's a natural thing. We all want mom and dad to be proud of us or our sister or whoever, right? We all want these familial connections. But what is unfortunate is that these familial connections are not based on you and I connecting as just two individuals and respecting what each other likes and being curious about one another. It's about control. And I need you to come be exactly what I am. Mm -hmm. I am this thing over here. And as long as you're over here with me and you're doing exactly what I want you to do and being exactly who I want you to be, then I can be proud of you. But I can't be, Jehovah's Witnesses can't be proud of anyone who is not one of Jehovah's Witnesses. And so the dichotomy, the, the whole thing is set up on the wrong premise to begin with. All of the relationships are set up on the wrong foundation. It's not a, a relationship between two individuals loving and respecting who the other person is, even if it's different. It's the, the demand to be same. It's a cult, right? You got to be one of us. And yep. if you're not... It just shows how shallow those relationships really are and that they're never really built on depth because they're not able to be any deeper than, do you look like me? Do you think like me? Do you act like me? Will you do exactly what I do? And if you won't, then I can't have you in my life. And so yeah. it's just a false relationship to begin with. It's just not... I'm not saying that there's nothing real there. I'm not saying that none of the good moments were real. But the foundation is wrong. It's not yeah. healthy. No. And that's why it was easy to crumble. You know, I chose happiness. Mm -hmm. I chose to live my own authentic life. 
and this is who I am. And she can either take it or leave it. I had to treat her as a death and I mourned the loss for years. Mm-hmm. And then I moved on. So and I had to, I developed a sense of peace with everything. You know, she's happy living her life that way. So be it. You know, I am now considered an apostate <laughs> because I don't have anything nice to say about the witnesses as a whole and anyone who will listen to me. If I help at least one person, I think I'm doing good, you know, mm-hmm. but anybody with eyeballs can see that I'm just saying what's already out there, you know? Well, yeah. And you're, so I wrote down something you said earlier. Um, your mom uh, threatened you not to tell anyone about what was going on in your house, right? Yeah. We were groomed by Jehovah's Witnesses. The cult groomed us to be silent. The word apostate. Just, you can leave, just keep your mouth shut and never tell anybody what happened here, which is why I'm so adamant about telling people what is happening there because it's hurtful and destructive to people's lives, even the people who think they're happy in it. And although there are some people there who are genuinely sweet in certain ways, they still had, they would still let somebody die of a need for blood transfusion. They would still shun their own kids. They're still anti LGBTQ. There's like a lot of things where they're still hating on other people and very judgmental of others and not inclusive in any way. And it's not good for them either, right? And no. but it's you can leave, but if you ever tell anybody what happened, then you're an apostate and you're the worst of the worst. And how dare you? Right? <laughs> you're so detestable they, to God. <laughs> yes, they want your voice. They want your voice forever. They want to oh, yeah. own that part of you forever. And that's not okay um, that we were all groomed to keep quiet. That's why it took me so long to come out. (laughs) It took me so long. Like this to me right here, this is as brazen as it gets, Mm -hmm. you know, speaking out on a global level to anyone who will listen to your story so Mm -hmm. that people can be made aware of what is really going on, Mm -hmm. you know. When I was molested within the organization, I was told, you know, at first of all, I was a liar because more than two people didn't see it happen. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know? We all know that molesters often do it in front of a crowd. Yes. Exactly. You know, so I'm already a liar. You know, I'm already a liar. And you're a child. So who's going to believe you? You know, that's number one. You know, but just keep your mouth shut. We'll, we'll deal with it internally. We'll deal with it from within the organization. And it was never dealt with, you know. So when people want to come to me and talk to me and they want to pick my brain and they want to know all about this loving organization that covers up gross, gross, just atrocities. Crimes? Yeah, crimes. No, we don't need the the world's input. Yeah, you do, because these people need to be in jail. You know, because if they were to protect everybody, not just people in the congregation, but who else are these people offending against? Exactly. You know, and it's it's not just misdeeds of others, misgivings. It's straight up cover up, you know, and I finally decided that I'm not going to be quiet anymore. You know, I am fully out and about and. For the first time in forever, I can breathe without this fear of somebody coming to my door, reprimanding me, getting counseled for X, Y, Z, pick something that I've done. You know, that that fear that I talked about earlier is gone. I have never slept so peacefully in ever in my life because all of the dark cloud hanging over me that is the Jehovah's Witnesses, it's gone. It's gone now. And because 
of the way I was treated when I got this fellowship, that alone will have me never going back. I was going to say, so let's touch on that. What um, you got baptized. I got baptized. To, to <laughs> have this relationship with your sister. And then uh, how long and what transpired between getting baptized then and getting disfellowships? What, what period of time was there um, and what happened? Well, I got baptized. And of course, it was a huge celebration. I had a, there was a big party at some sister's house. The elders were there. It was fantastic. And that lasted maybe about a month. <laughs> After about a month, I was I became inactive because I just my heart was always in the world. I'm not even gonna lie, you know. I had always longed for the taste of freedom. <laughs> and I got I was going to say, one. is your heart in the world or is your heart just in being the freedom to be authentic? Exactly. You know, it's the programming, you know, mm -hmm. I, I still considered it being in the world. Sure. And it, in actuality, I'm just living my life. <laughs> you just want it out of the prison. Exactly. And I, I said, okay, here we go. We're dabbling. We're in and out. We're in and out again. We're leading this double life. You're too old for this shit. You don't have to do this. You're an adult. So I became inactive and I started smoking weed and dating a worldly guy and he was spending the night and we were happy and things were fine. And then shepherding calls started and the woman who uh, was studying with me. She started talking to me and that fear started to creep back in. And at this point, it had been like a couple of years, two, three years that I was completely out there and just working, living my life, doing my thing. And then the fear kept creeping back in and I broke up with my boyfriend and I got sick. Yeah, that's I started to get sick and then they, they started to come around more and they started to fill my head more with the doctrine and you know there'll be no sickness in the new system and blah blah blah, blah. <laughs> and I'm like, you know what? You need to go back. You need to go back and stop being in and out. You're either in or you're out. Pick one. And I I went back. And I went to one of the elders uh, who was at my baptism party or whatever you want to call it. And I went to him in confidence. And I said, I want to come back. I'm sick of being out there. I want to, you know, come back and I want to do right again. And here's what I've been doing when I was out there. And he said, okay. And I thought that was going to be the end of it. Maybe a week later, um, he taps me on the shoulder. He's like, myself and a couple of the brothers would like to speak to you. I'm like, okay. So I go into the back <laughs> with the brothers. And they proceeded to ask me in this room, all men, what exactly had transpired while I was out there. Go into detail. I'm inviting you in my bedroom and under my sheets with my ex-boyfriend. We want to know everything you were doing. And I cleared my conscience and told them everything I had been doing. And they said, okay. And I thought that was the end of it. A few days later, we would like to see you again. And I'm like, okay, fine. I thought I was going to probably be maybe reproved or, you know, something like that. Counseled, since this is my first time technically as a witness, baptized Christian, leniency. You know, I'll be publicly reproved even, you know, I'll, I would have been fine with that. Oh, no, no. We have decided to disfellowship you. Come again. <laughs> I was floored. So I was not okay with that. And I told them for all the reasons I just said to you, this is my first official crime as a <laughs> as a well, baptized. And you came to them. You were sorry. You came to them and wanted to change. That's repentance. Yes, I am, and that's what I told them. I'm like, I'm repentant. I came to you, 
and spilled my whole life to you. And I don't get a reprieve, you know, a, a one, a, a one a do over, nothing. <laughs> no, we decided to disfellowship you. So I said, no, <laughs> no. And I wrote a letter to the society. And I said, you guys need to figure this out, <laughs> you know, because this is not okay with me. This is my first official offense as a baptized witness. And I don't agree with this at all. Can you please look into my case or whatever and, you know, overturn their decision because this is not okay. And it took a while for me to get a letter back from them that pretty much said that we've, you know, spoken with your elders and this is a loving provision from Jehovah, this discipline. And we really hope that one day you turn your life around, you know, the whole wording that they use. I still have that letter somewhere. Um, Gaslighting. Yeah. And, and we, you know, this is for your benefit. This is for your own good. You know, we're glad that you feel comfortable enough to come to us. And we're to, we took everything into consideration but we're going to stick with what their decision is and disfellowship you. First of all, when they first told me I was getting disfellowship and I did not agree with it, all of their attitudes changed. The environment became hostile, mm -hmm. daggers, glaring. It was so uncomfortable even going to the meeting because they literally looked at me like I was a piece of shit. The kicker though, was when the decision was final and they gave me the letter in the parking lot after the meeting. Um, a, the brother came to me and handed me the letter and they said, they didn't overturn it, here's your letter. And the look on his face, the smug look and the grin he had, like, ha ha, we won. Here's your letter, you've been ousted. I still remember the look on his face. And that alone turned me off. So despite all the other information I learned after the fact about everything was enough to turn me off, but his action alone, that alone turned me off forever, ever. Because I will never be in a room again and having four or five dudes dictate to me as to how I'm supposed to be living. When your wife is one of the biggest culprits in the kingdom hall. Okay, this woman literally always looked like a hooker, always did. And her husband would be the first one to give a talk about the decency of the sisters in their dress and modesty and all Oh, that's things. probably why they gave him that talk. Mm -hmm. And your wife literally dresses like a streetwalker all the time. You know, and living in a more affluent area of California, and they're always preaching modesty and don't be like the world and material possessions. You go to the Kingdom Hall right now and you look in the parking lot and you can see all the Maseratis, the BMWs, the, you know, all of the luxury cars. And now go to their house and see where, see where they're living. Gated communities. I mean, I live in one too, but I'm in the world, so you know, it doesn't matter. <laughs> but these are the people that are Not talking. With, modesty. <laughs> yeah, you know, these are the people that are talking material. I don't care if I'm, a, um, you know, I love my material possessions. I can say Enjoy that. Your life. I work yeah. hard. You know, I work hard for them. I don't care. But these people are preaching modesty and don't be like the world and their material, blah, blah, blah. And meanwhile, in your Armani suit with your Rolex watch, you know, with your spit shine shoes, getting into your brand new Maserati, you know, don't talk to me. Both sides of their mouth. And I was like, after how I was treated and after I see the hypocrisy with my own eyes, you people live like paupers, but we're going to be living like kings, you know. So much hypocrisy. And I said, I knew right then and there. After I got this fellowship, I knew that was it for me. And I just had to come to terms with the loss of my sister, the loss of certain friends I thought I had. That's a whole different thing, you know, because I'll never forget when I experienced homelessness. Within the congregation, 
One of the older sisters that I had befriended who lived in a three bedroom home told me that I couldn't stay with her because she really loved living by herself. The woman who studied with me, who had a spare room, she's the one who told me that I should start looking in the shelters. So yeah, these loving and witnesses. So you were one of Jehovah's Witnesses at the time. You were a baptized mm -hmm. sister. Mm -hmm. And whatever had happened in life that had led you to a point where, I mean, it sounds like it's a fairly affluent area. I'm sure mm -hmm. rent isn't cheap. No. Um, and so, I got sick. Oh, and that was because you got sick. I got sick and I lost my job and I could no longer pay my bills or anything. When I got this fellowship, I was living with a witness family. The day I got this fellowship, I was out the next day, homeless again. Yep. Still they immediately stopped talking to me. All of them. Sick? Were you still sick then too? No, uh, I wasn't, I but I just that, didn't That have... was an additional thing. Yeah. Um, so back so... out into the street. Yeah. But these loving witnesses and their loving provisions, you got to yeah. love that. Yes. Yes. Never uh, again. Worldly people um, have treated me better than any witness ever has. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I agree. So, how long did it take you? So, after, so well, let me ask you. So, you got disfellowshipped. Um, how did that impact your relationship with your sister? Um, in other words, did she say anything to you, or did things just quietly go away and there was shunning, or what were the what were the repercussions? Well, shockingly enough, she didn't stop speaking to me cold turkey. Okay. She still um she still interacted with me, you know, over the phone, text, whatever. We still, you know, kept in touch, but it was sporadic. Mm. Um the the nail in the coffin was um in twenty eighteen. My father was shopping at Lowe's and he died at Lowe's. He had a heart attack and dropped dead right inside of Lowe's. And she called me and she told me and I didn't feel one way or the other. You know, he had never been a part of my life, really. So um, except briefly as a teenager, but um, she just she had always had this arrogance to her and she had always had this preachy vibe. Like she already knew I didn't want to hear anything about witnessing. Don't try to witness to me. You know, I grew up in this madness, just like you did. I know the Bible back and forward. You know, I know you don't have to be preachy, but she goes into her arrogant spiel. And at the time I had been, I was living with my fiance and um, she was going on and on and on about something and I just, it was just too much and she's always right and she doesn't want to hear any opinion you have because she's always right and you're always wrong and I had just, something happened and I had snapped and I hung up on her and that was in 2018 and I haven't heard from her since. <laughs> My ex-fiance and I broke up. Um, so I flew back to Connecticut to regroup again, and then COVID hit. So I sheltered in place for a year and a half in Connecticut. And during that whole time, I texted her and called her to let her know I was back in town and if she wanted to get together and talk. And she never replied. So I haven't heard from her since. And I'm okay with that. Because <laughs> you have to be, you Her know? Decision. Her decision. Her reasons. It doesn't mean there's it, anything wrong with you. Exactly. You know, I thought about driving to her home and knocking on her door and saying hi. And then I thought about it. And I'm like, if she doesn't want to talk to you, she, she knows you're in town and mm -hmm. she knows you don't live here. You haven't lived here for years. She knows you're in, you're in town. You know, I was there a year and a half, you know, and nothing. So, you know, I'm at that age where it's like, I'm not going to push the issue. You know how to reach me. <laughs> you know, I tried. I tried to extend my apology for hanging out. I, I tried to mend this. And this is how it's been our whole adult, our adult life. 
it's always been push, pull, push, pull. And I've always done everything to try to make her happy. And I decided that now I got to do what I need to do to make me happy. Yeah, you got baptized to make her happy. She won't return a call. So what you going to do, right? Exactly. Uh, that, that, you know? that is what it is. Um, I'm not giving up my happiness for other people anymore. I did that my entire yeah. life. And it made me absolutely miserable. And so, now I'm happy. So what got you to a point where, you know, because there's, it's one thing to be this fellowships. Um, it's another thing to be kind of mentally and emotionally awake to it all and to, you know, start understanding what Watchtower is, where it comes from, various things about it. What were there? So how did you start waking up, I guess, more mentally and emotionally to some of the realities of of Jehovah's Witnesses beyond just your experience? You know, where did you st did you start listening to podcasts or watching YouTube or things like that? Did you start doing research online independently or how did you start putting together the pieces of what it was you had been involved with your whole life? They did it for me. <laughs> to be honest with you, yeah, they did it for me. They cannot not stay out of the news for one thing there you go. or another. <laughs> you know? There you go, child and... sexual abuse, if nothing else, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. unfortunately. I didn't have to do too much, you know? They did it for me. And the more I started listening to podcasts and the more I started meeting other XJWs, mm -hmm. and then I found a support system that I didn't even know existed that has multiplied and multiplied and multiplied. I, you know, when you're going through things, you kind of think you're the only one, you know, and you know you're not, but you kind of feel that way. That's, that's why they I'm don't want you to talk about it, right? Mm -hmm. So that you feel like you're the only one. It's part of, again, part of the grooming. It is. It is. And then you discover power in numbers. Mm -hmm. And then you start talking to people and you know that they're not lying based upon your own experiences, based on the verbiage they use because they have their own little language and their own little, you know, ideals that only other witnesses would really know about. You know, there are certain things in Revelation that people talk about that only other witnesses would know about that. You know, they, it's their own little community. And I found my tribe, you know, and it sucks that so many people have such horrible stories but at the same time, it's kind of awesome that we found each other through mm -hmm. podcasts like this, through um, other YouTube groups. I might belong to maybe 10 or so mm -hmm. that I faithfully follow. Mm -hmm. You can go and turn on like the, your computer and you can literally find a million and one things that this organization is doing that. When I first heard about this new light, I literally wanted to jump through my computer and strangle whoever came up with this BS, you know, because we, we don't even have to go into 1914 and the spin that they have put on this world that you, you and I are not even supposed to be here because it's supposed to be gone by now, you mm -hmm. know, and they keep putting a spin as to the new date and just <laughs> I cannot get the words out fast enough when it comes to all the hypocrisy and the lies and the backtracking and the covering up of certain things and then this guy getting ousted from Bethel <laughs> Morris <laughs> yeah, well, oh he, my... he was ousted as, as a governing body member which is even how does that even... happen <laughs> I didn't even know that that was allowed, you know? I just, I, and just all the idiotic pillow gate and all this other. Mm. <laughs> yes. I just, you know, if it weren't so, if it, it weren't so gut wrenching that this organization has destroyed and killed so many people, I could seriously laugh about them all day. But well, a lot of us as ex Jehovah's Witnesses have a fairly dark sense of humor because you have to learn to laugh at some of this to some degree. Um, I mean, some of it is is laughable and it in its absurdity, 
even though we can also cry together about the the pain that it has caused so many right um, it's 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 horrible it's it's absolutely horrible and it it's amazing to see that there's still people out there trying to defend it i find them in my youtube comments and such and it's just oh and the gaslighting and the manipulation and the way they spin things in the comments and such it's amazing to watch uh, mm -hmm. people try to make it seem like the organization has no responsibility or very little responsibility for things it's just they are who they are, and that's fine. Um, we don't, again, have to have toxic people in our lives. So yeah. um, we can move on and, and enjoy them. Um, so you've worked on yourself a lot. Um, I guess you haven't. The one question I sometimes ask people is, is there anything that you would want to say to those who shun you if you could? No. No, nah, I think that's fair. I, I love that is a that is a good answer too. Fair no, enough. if there's one thing that I would say, um, it actually goes out to XJWs, mm. and it would be to remember what we've all been through, and be gentle and kind, because no one is more judgmental than an XJW. I discovered. And that's Ooh. shocking and it's kind of, you know, hurtful, but remember what we've been through before you open your mouth or before you type a sentence, you know, because the internet is forever, number one. And number two, we've all been through it in one way or another. There's a reason why we're XJWs, whether we've been disfellowshipped or you woke up and disassociated your own self, you know? So just be mindful, you know? I've faced more backlash and hate from extra Jehovah's Witnesses than anybody. And it's at the crazy, end of the day, it? <laughs> it is, but, but it's also not. Um, at the end of the day, um, just because we all left a similar place, we're, I mean, think about it. XJWs often mimic a lot of what you see in Jehovah's Witnesses. There's a lot of backstabbing. There's a lot of backbiting. There's a lot of activists who are at each other all the time. There's a lot of things. Um, people want to oust someone from the community because they did a thing, um, because we've got to shun, right? We've got, we must shun. Um, there's a lot of, um, so you take people who have been in active trauma their whole life as Jehovah's Witnesses. They're now ex-Jehovah's Witnesses. They now have a, an, they have added trauma to the trauma they had as Jehovah's Witnesses. I sometimes think that the ex-community is in its own way at times, or certain individuals seem to be more unhealthy potentially than they even were as Jehovah's Witnesses because now they have the added trauma of having been shunned having their entire life ripped away from them. They're in a world that they don't understand. They feel lost. They're scared. And then they lash out at other people, just like that dog that's been abused, that's at the end of that chain is going to bite because this is where it is that's scared and hurts. And I think that a lot of the ex community comes off a certain way at times, certain people. I think it's the minority, but... So now it's a vocal minority um, because they're carrying around so much pain. <clears throat> they've never gotten help. Maybe they still have certain narcissistic traits from the cults. I know I had a lot that I had to shed. Um, and it's, yeah, it's just not just because you could take the person out of Jehovah's Witnesses, but that doesn't take the Jehovah's Witnesses out of the person, right? And a lot of people's Jehovah's Witnesses still showing. And yeah. They got to, you know, I hope that in time they'll work on that. But we're not a cult in the ex-community. We are not this tight-knit community that I wish we could be. And uh, perhaps by the time this comes out, I'll be at liberty to discuss some things that I'm working on that I'm honestly not free to discuss right now for reasons. Um, but, you know, hopefully in time. I think we're also a young ex-cult community. 
I hope in time we we kind of grow up in some ways and maybe we can have nice things too and better resources. So that's all that'd I can say. Great. That'd be really great. It would. But would. you know, overall, it has been a, a healing journey. It really has. It has. Um, yeah. Knowing that there are others out there, not a couple of people, not a hundred or two thousands of people and more and more keep leaving because they're waking up to the fact that this is a very dangerous cult that they're in. They've been lied to for years, like myself. They've been indoctrinated and brainwashed and fear is very powerful, very powerful. Yep. It can stunt you on a level where you just, you can't move. You can't breathe. You're afraid of your own shadow. I was terrified to do anything almost daily. And it's a shame to be held hostage like that. Of You know, you're willfully allowing yourself to be held hostage like that. When there's a great big world out there just waiting to be lived in. Is it perfect out there? God, no, it's downright terrifying out here. <laughs> <laughs> It certainly can be, but I mean, so is it inside the organization, right? At least I hear you have the option of some healthy and free things. Exactly. You know, I no longer have this fear of this entity that's going to destroy me in a horrific way if I don't do everything. Mm -hmm. You know, I no longer believe that these men hold any power to govern my life. They can't even govern their own lives. <laughs> Kicking out your own governing body, you know, it's, you know, it's laughable. And I just, I look back on all the years that I've wasted and I can't get those back. But what I can do moving forward is live as decently and as authentically as I possibly can and do what makes me happy. You know, I'm not out here murdering anybody. I'm not sleeping with somebody's husband, I'm paying my taxes, I'm living clean, you know, I, you know, I, I can look at myself in the mirror and know that I'm decent people now, you know, I used to be questionable, I used to run with some questionable folk, but you live and you learn, and you, you grow. You unhealthy, because you came from an unhealthy place, you've continued to yeah. work on yourself, grow, get healthier, and now you're going to have healthier things in your life. I um, am. One of those being happiness. So let me, so let's, you know, I, I try to end on a on a good note if I can. So what is that happiness for you? What does happiness look like for um for Andrea? What what's what makes you happy? Looks like this. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> no, I've come a long way, you know. I'm a business owner. I have been for a long time now. I'm a chef and I'm a caterer. Oh, cool. um, I am. I worked in the industry. I ended my career at Disney, um, and I decided to semi-retire now and focus on filmmaking. I'm directing my first film um, this year, and it centers a, around an abused little girl. Hmm. I'm taking it back. And I'm giving back. And the script has already been out there and it has already resonated with so many people. The feedback has been amazing. And things can only go up from here. You know, I'm in a great place mentally, which has taken me years to get to this point. And like I said, you know, I honestly get a chance to do what I love to do for a living. A lot of people can't say that. Mm -hmm. And I now have the freedom to travel if I want, to work on my passion projects, garden. My garden's overrun, but I saw a pepper growing today. I was so happy. <laughs> the green thumb was lacking. I can't grow a single damn thing inside the house. Outside, thriving. I even have a pumpkin for Halloween growing. I was oh, like, where did you come from? I didn't, you know, you should see it. It's so wobbly and wonky looking, but I'm so proud of that little pumpkin. You know, awesome. just, it's the little things, you yep. know, you know, I'm getting ready for the holidays, you know, and I'm just, I'm so grateful to even people like you 
who have provided this outlet for people like me to come through and just share their story. It's not always going to be roses and sunshine. That's not life. But I no longer live this facade, you know. I no longer have to pretend to be happy when I'm terrified. It's like growing up, that's all I did. As an adult, that's all I did. And now I'm just me. And I'm okay with that. That is how we end this. <laughs> you are happy because now you're just you. And that's all you ever needed to be. It's just we were never allowed to. Now you are allowed to. You can find, you're finding who you are. You know who you are. You found it. You're enjoying it. You're expressing it. And I appreciate you expressing it today because this will help other people out there. You know, as you've mentioned, as I say so often at the end, to feel less alone because other people have been through what you've been through too. Well, thank you for having me.